Well, hello all and welcome back to my channel. We have lost power in the house today and I love it when that happens because all the machines cut off. Can't have no washing machine, can't have no dishwasher running. And uh, it goes well with a topic that I want to talk about entitled <laughs> Why Modern Life Sucks. <laughs> So it's cold outside, it's actually sleeting outside, and I got a fire going in the library. And the way I want to talk about this subject is to read uh, for you from the introduction to um, Father Vincent McNabb's The Church and the Lamb. This preface in this introduction is by Dr. William Fahey. Um, he used to be the... Uh, he worked at Christendom College in Front Row, Virginia, for a while, and now I think he's the president of Thomas More College. And uh, I think I'm saying that right. Fahey, 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 William Fahey. Sounds good. If he watches this, he can correct me. If somebody else knows how to pronounce it, and you can tell me. I'm not good with pronouncing, pronouncing certain names. But uh, why modern life sucks? Isn't that a good title? So Father Vincent McNabb, for those of you who don't know, was one of the um, leading members of the Catholic land movement in England in the 1920s. This book, I think, was first written in 1920 or 1924, somewhere in there. And uh, there were, since over the past 100 years, there's really been three forces to, that, that have spoken out in important ways against the, 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 the industrialism of the modern world. The distributist, primarily G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Belloc in England, and um, C.S. Lewis was also very much concerned with industrialism, as was uh, Tolkien. But in the United States, the Southern Agrarians, or the Fugitive Agrarians, as they were known at the time, uh, who were also writing in the 1920s and published I'll Take My Stand, which is considered to be the Southern Agrarian Manifesto, published that in 1930, November 1930. So there's a lot of activity uh, during the interwar period of the 20th century among people who are concerned about the uh, nature of, excuse me while I poke my fire, that are ex concerned about the nature of the consumer culture, the modern industrialized culture to which we uh, now have inherited. Many of us now don't know what it's like to live without a consumer culture. But I want you to listen to the, if I can read it with the sunlight we got left here. Uh, I want to read to you some information from this introduction. And so, uh, Dr. William Fahey is, is talking about why people should pay attention to uh, Father Vincent McNabb. Why should you care? And so I, this is so beautiful. That I have not um, read a description that really shows how ridiculous modern life is. I, I haven't read anything this good in quite some time. And by the way, the third force is Wendell Berry. <laughs> so you have the distributist in England, you have the Southern Agrarians, and then eventually in the 1960s up until now, you have Wendell Berry. In my mind, those are the three great forces of uh, alternative views of agrarian ideology over the past 100 years. So uh, I'll just read what he's got to say here, and we use this to, to talk about some things. Yet a reader may ask, what really is the relevance of such thought today, meaning agrarianism, back to the land stuff? Even if we accept McNabb's personal holiness, has not the science of economics so advanced that we may understand and treat our social ills much more effectively than in Leo XIII's or Vincent McNabb's day? Surely we do not have to worry about the industrialization of the workplace or the effects of factory life on the home. The foulness of a disrupted food system has passed away, as have the dark satanic mills of the western landscape. Food and material wealth are in abundance. Classical liberalism has won the day. 
Surely no one would consider Father McNabb's uh, positions as either prescient for his day or appropriate to our own. As for homesteading and small crafts, these have gone the way of the draft horse, the windmill, and the iron forge. Well, dear reader, the fact that you have kept going after the last paragraph points to at least a whisper of hesitation over whether or not all is well. Modern man, for all his climate, controlled comforts, and toys, still doubts that he has everything right. Let's turn first to the workplace. In McNabb's day, there was a cry to improve the hideous conditions of the worker. In certain areas, victory can be claimed, though to what body or system we should grant the laurel leaves is disputed. Certainly, working conditions in many Western countries are improved. On the other hand, most of the so-called manufacturing work uh, that McNabb challenged so squarely has moved to the Southern Hemisphere and the Far East comfortably beyond the horizon of suburbia. Do we really think that the working conditions at any of the mills and factories that provide our clothing, our tools, and raw materials are significantly different from the slums of Pittsburgh, Birmingham, or Dublin a century ago? Think about it now, how much made in China stuff you have in your house. What are the working conditions in those places where our made in China, uh, made overseas items are coming from. Even in the fluorescent glow of our western cubicles, the workplace has significant problems. The 31-hour work week achieved by the middle of the 20th century has been abandoned. Any mention of it is largely erased from our popular history. Now let us for a moment travel to a modern North American home. Now get this, you got to pay attention to this. Let us for a moment travel to a modern North American home. Homeward, the happy hunter of the free west rides, usually, usually alone for some 45 minutes or more in the great symbol of his liberation, the car. How much time do you spend in a car going to work backwards and forwards every day? Though it cost him on average over $10,000 per annum to maintain his machine, and though it slays enough people each year to be classified an epidemic, life without two or three vehicles is now inconceivable. Now let us enter the modern home. The home, which is nearly a thousand square feet larger than that of our grandparents. The home which his great-grandparents paid for within a decade, and which now, if he bothers staying there for more than a few years, takes a full 30 to pay for. Now let us sit with the modern man of the West at a meal, if we sit at all. And where is the family, that is to say? Where is the other person who brings in the required second income? And where are the one or perhaps two children, quite possibly the fruit of the same union? Quite possibly the fruit of the same union, but by no means a guarantee anymore. Alas, one and all are exercising their freedoms. His spouse must work in her fluorescent cubicle a little later to reduce her stress, the sign of her economic liberation, she must, before returning home, go to the great luminous glass block cave off to exercise on a never-ending plastic conveyor while watching with two dozen other fiercely independent and liberated women the same cable news program prophesying wars and rumors of war. The gym. He's talking about people going to a gym because they don't have any other outlet for exercise. The children eat alone, but each apparently content as they are plugged into some virtual world where one may engage in such archaic activities as fighting with swords, searching for treasure, warding off dark powers from a good kingdom, speaking with imaginary creatures, and camping under a starlit sky. We thank the heavens that digital technology has made such youthful fun not only safe, but possible. This is all satire, you've got to remember. All satire. But it shows how utterly ridiculous we have made modern life. Food. Food still unites the family. That is to say, no matter where or what you eat in the United States, you and your loved ones will all be partaking in flavors created in laboratories from the same part of New Jersey. <laughs> the flame broiled low-fat burger picked up on the way back from aerobics. The country-style chicken breast prepared just the way you like it in the microwave. The Thai takeout that the children wolf down as they learn more about an endangered rainforest from the tourism channel. 
all were produced along the same corridor off the Jersey Turnpike near South Brunswick. <laughs> he just really is hammering into this stuff. This is, of course, a comical picture, merely a satire. Every age has its difficulties, does it not? At least we are secure in ours. Yet we must admit, though, that when McNabb warned that the family and the life of the family was imperiled, he was not wrong. Something as small and distant as industrial capitalism and something as near and menacing as canned food were anathema to Father McNabb. It would also have been anathema to most American farm families at the time he was writing this, and not to mention uh, English farm families. There were, they were of the same beast, a dreadful beast crouching to devour the mother and child left undefended by the father. Whether by a true choice or no, women have been swept from the home and from the life that was dignified and was their own. And men, men have taken up the life of socioeconomic nomads, knowing no allegiance to work, for work knows them not, and slowly forgetting what duty and paternal piety mean. If this is in doubt, let us turn again to our modern household. <laughs> our age now views as domesticated a woman who subscribes to an illustrated cooking magazine and prepares brand beef for the precision of a German chemical engineer. Lost to the art of cooking without a reference library, pasta and sauce from a jar constitute a home-cooked meal. That we are momentarily satisfied with this state may be due to genuine advances in natural or organic food preparation, or it may only be a conditioned response enabling us not to face social deficiencies. I mean, it just goes on and on. It, it, this, this reading is showing us the sheer stupidity and ridiculousness of modern life. We spend so much time trying to save time that we don't have anything to do with the time when it's saved. <laughs> Except get on a screen. There was a time when cooking, sewing, and all the domestic arts were natural and vocational expressions of womanhood. Mothers did these things because their love for family called forth beauty and care. Thankfully, there is still affection, and with affection, the desire to restore the home. If only some clear path could be shown. Man, having longer uh, been callous and longer disenfranchised from his own art, seems happier than modern women. The pressure of being sole breadwinner is gone. A work less dreary, you know. Again, we collide with our illusions. Let us harden ourselves to the probable sting that comes to most men when they contemplate that our economic system blocks them from being the economic sustainer of the family. The joint worker household is not an exercise in freedom, but a necessity for most. The two cars and a half-ton truck, the 2,500-square-foot house, the clothing, the gadgets, the vacations all require two incomes. We are surfeit with what McNabb called secondary wealth to the point that we are rarely enjoying what is primary, such as health, and the food and the shelter necessary for our station in life. To what end are men fierce providers? Their jobs and lifestyles long insulate them from the experience of husbandry, paternal sacrifice. Their co-worker spouses are not in any real sense dependent, socially or even economically, or rather, the dependency too often becomes a kind of contractual benefit in a rapidly materialistic world. What they supply for their children, they know in their hearts, is ephemeral junk to be replaced at the next birthday or special occasion by yet more plastic and electric gadgetry. I still feel the same way every time Christmas rolls around. Everybody goes out and buys all this plastic crap and puts under a Christmas tree. It's ephemeral junk. It teaches children nothing. You buy people screens. You put kids that are three and four years old on a computer screen or on a little tablet, and you teach them how to run a cell phone, but they don't know how to cook anything or split wood or grow a garden or feed chickens or take care of any kind of animal by the time they're 10 years old. I had a good farmer friend of mine in Alabama told me one time that 
when his grandchildren all turned 12 years old, all his uh, granddaughters, that is, he gave them a frying pan. He said that was the best gift he could have ever gave them was a frying pan. That may sound sexist to some folks, but uh, I stand with my farmer friend from Alabama. <laughs> For a small group, do-it-yourself shops allow some expression of craft to emerge from the eviscerated life of a white-collar worker. One could also mention camping and certain sports as activities that still remind the male worker of his masculine flesh and sinew. Yet these activities, engaged in by an ever-decreasing number of the population, are again done as hobbies and stress relievers. They do not constitute part of a natural cycle of life nor are they done as part of a process of enhancing and creating primary wealth. Instead, modern men drink deeply of nostalgia. Whew, man, he's got it going on. Ha! This domestic scene fixed somewhere between satire and tragedy. Fixed somewhere between satire and tragedy. That's exactly right. It's ridiculous and sad at the same time. The way we live in the modern world sucks. It is sad and, and ridiculous simultaneously. Let it arouse us. It is something, after all, with which to make a start. Traditions may yet be restored precisely because human nature is enduring. At moments of crisis, clarity can come forth in heroism and sacrifice, be readily observed. A natural life with sane and regular rhythms is not the product of constant crisis. Tempered by crisis, yes, but a healthy organism seeking, seeks equipoise and peace. Listen to this. A natural life is the product of a small, healthy community grounded in the common traditional and religious life of the West. Western civilization, Christendom. And he gets into a larger discussion of Catholicism and uh, <clears throat> the nature of, the, the, again, the ridiculous nature of how we've allowed Christianity to devolve in our, in our modern world. Now, that is similar to, uh, now, that, that is a, a description of the, the, the way we live now, which is not, that was written several years ago, but it's not far off from the way it is now. Uh, even though people largely are able to work from home now ever since COVID, we still do not use the time at home to produce food for our own table to be more responsible for our everyday things. Now, this is Andrew Lytle from 1930, his essay in I'll Take My Stand. Andrew Lytle uh, was from, uh, I think he was uh, born in North Alabama, if I'm not mistaken, but he spent the majority of his life in Tennessee, particularly uh, around Monego Mountain, which is off I-24 going from Chattanooga toward Nashville. But this is, he, he's describing, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is, this is 1930, nearly 100 years ago. Lytle is describing what uh, life, everyday life on a southern farm would have looked like in the 1920s. And really, this would have been late 19th century, early 20th century. And he's describing what is at danger of being lost. Fifty years after he published this in the 1980s, Lytle wrote a, a separate essay, which was a reflection on the Southern Agrarian Movement 50 years after it started. And what he concluded in the 1980s, remember this is 40 years ago now, is that we failed. The people who thought that the old rural way of life, the old country, old-fashioned way of life, the people who thought that it would never go away, that it would always be around, they were fooled. They were shocked by the time we get into the few decades after the Second World War and discover that consumerism and industrial capitalism completely plows under the small farm world that Lytle is describing here in 1930. I'll just select a couple of random paragraphs. The kitchen leads out to the back L-shaped porch upon its banister, or if there is no banister upon the wash table, a bucket of water in its gourd, a tin pan, soap, and towel wait to serve the morning toilet. The towel will hang on a folding rack fixed to the wall. This rack may also serve long strings of red peppers drying in the air. A bell post rises up near the kitchen to ring the boys in from the fields at dinner time. 
and this would be 12 o'clock noon. This is another uh, thing that has become completely destroyed. Dinner is at 12 noon. Supper time is in the evening. Dinner is at 12. Supper's in the evening. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've confused people, even in our own part of the world. You say dinner, they think you're supposed to be talking about the evening meal. It is the midday meal. In the back behind the kitchen is the smoke house and several outhouses. Iron kettles for washing tilt to one side in the ashes of an old fire, some distance away. An ash hopper made from a hollow log, no longer in use, lies up against the buggy house, having gone the way of the kitchen fireplace. The life of soap and hominy making is now bought in town. Before dawn, the roosters and the farmer feel the tremendous silence, chilling and filling the gap between night and day. He gets up, makes the fires, and rings the rising bell. He could arouse the family with his voice, but it has been the custom to ring the bell. So every morning it sounds out, taking its place among the other bells in the neighborhood. Each, according to his nature, gets up and prepares for the day. The wife has long been in the kitchen uh, when the boys go to the barn. Some of the girls help her while the farmer plans the morning work and calls out directions. Then he talks about the importance of the milk cow on the old farmstead. Oh, yes. Industrialism gives an electric refrigerator, bottled milk, and dairy butter. It takes a few minutes to remove it from the ice to the table while the agrarian process has taken several hours and is spread out over two or three days. Industrialism saves time. This is just so important. Industrialism saves time. But what is to be done with this time? The milkmaid can't go to the movies, read the signboards, and go play bridge all the time. In the moderate circumstances of this family, deprived of her place in the home economy, she will be exiled to the town to clerk all day. If the income of the family can afford it, she remains idle and therefore miserable. Oh. <laughs> oh, this is so good. And he continues. He continues. He talks about the daily diet that people had. Um, <laughs> oh, it's just beautiful. Anyway, I, I, the, the agrarian South. Okay, here we go. The agrarian South, therefore, whose culture was impoverished but not destroyed by the war, meaning the Civil War, the great unpleasantness, the War of Northern Arrogance, and its aftermath should dread industrialism like a pison snake. For the South long since finished its pioneering. It can only do violence to its provincial life when it allows itself to be forced into the aggressive state of mind of an earlier period. Mm, mm, mm. And Lytle goes on eventually and he has a very famous quote where he says, A farm is not a place to grow wealthy. It's a place to grow corn. And so it's just ridiculous if you just sit around and think about how stupid modern society has become. We spend so much money on junk that doesn't matter. And then we have time and we don't know what to do with it. We sit around and fiddle with our hands. People need front porches again. People don't sit on front porches and talk to one another. They don't talk to their neighbors. We live in these isolated little atomistic, individualistic uh, homes where we don't know what's happening outside of the four walls of our house. And part of that has to do with the fact that modern life itself sucks and we don't want to know what's going outside the four walls of our house. But I think there is still a chance where differences can be made, and it can be made at home, uh, and simply by people learning to be more responsible for their everyday things, the small little everyday things. Anyway, I've already talked enough. We'll continue this conversation next time. But for the time being, I'm going to go figure out uh, uh, if I can help the wife with anything because we lost power. I may need to go see what in the world I can do to help her. But... Uh, Tune in next time. This is a conversation we're going to continue, and I'm just going to keep talking about it as long as you keep listening. This is Alan Harrelson. Thank you for stopping by.